and I'm going to say thank you, friends, for joining me. Wow, these are some of the people I love most in the whole world. I only say some of them because there's other people that like could be here too, but I don't know people I love more than any of you. So that's pretty good. I guess Felix, maybe. Yeah, I was going to say. Eden. <laughs> Eden. I'm, going, I'm going live right now. Give me 45 seconds and I'll open the room. Okay, give me just a second. All right. Okay. I, 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 sent, I sent this invitation about four hours ago to the mf world so it's there's gonna there's a lot of people in the mf world yeah yeah i is that what i think it stands for <laughs> i hope not <laughs> i hope not too but we're not we're not open yet <laughs> so but yeah to to a my, lot of the my friend world my friend my that's that's it <laughs> exactly paul thank you I, I yeah i have my foils my foils so um i you're just ready to back. you're ready to go guys it's live on okay. facebook and you're now the place is populating oh cool okay. all right awesome. and now i'm watching i'm refreshing the open table conference page hoping i'll see something other than the book of hebrews discussion um but i'm not so far yeah, I'm not I'm troubled by that. Well, John, you want to just start then? I will. I'm just going to give a few minutes for people to populate. Hi, populators of the world. Welcome here. <laughs> John, can we come up with a different word, like, you know, for the, for everyone to join us or something? Because I feel like people are going to mishear that word from time to time. Populate? Yeah. Oh, it's such a good word. There's 8 billion of us now in the world, apparently. Yeah. As of last week, we can try fellowshippers. <laughs> we need to fit, we need to fellowship in. Is that how you do it? We're just going to let people fellowship in now. That yeah. felt terribly churchy. <laughs> <laughs> right. All right. Look, I think I just read about Howard Thurman and Felicia Morrell and others giving me a good retrieval of that word, actually. Yeah, yeah. So uh, we're going to go ahead and start. It's starting to slow down and it, people I'm sure will come in uh, over the next couple minutes or pop in whenever they want. But anyway, first of all, welcome to uh, a first ever for us. Not that we won't do it again, because I'm sure all these people that you see on the screen, except for me, are writing books. So we'll probably do this a, a bunch of times more. Um, but anyway, we're celebrating the launch of Brad Jerzak's new book, Out of the Embers, that actually is on, goes on sale tomorrow, November 22nd. And yeah, and we're going to talk about it. We're going to hear Brad talk about it here for the few minutes tonight. And we've got some questions and the panel here is going to uh, discuss some things with them, uh, some of their thoughts as well as some of his. There's the book, Faith After the Great Deconstruction. Um, and I think we all have experiences with this to some degree or another, um, but we're going to have a lot of fun. Brad, first of all, I want to say congratulations for writing the book. Um, it's, it's a great, great accomplishment, especially knowing you. So that was, that was a that funny was, joke. Yeah. It's kind of just for you <laughs> yeah, and me. all things considered, yeah, all things considered. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> um, but no, seriously, especially with your handicaps. Yes, yeah. <laughs> I didn't want to. I didn't want to use that word, Paul. But so, but anyway, we are we are proud of you. We're grateful to be called your friend and that we're associated with this. Um, so, anyway, let's just get going. I want to ask you a couple of questions, and the first one is pretty simple and straightforward, and that's just uh, professionally as a theologian and a writer. But then also personally, what motivated you to write this book, this particular book? Yeah, that's an excellent question. I, it's actually, uh, I, I'm not a pastor, but I would say it's primarily a pastoral concern for me. And that is that I saw folks who were um, going through different types of deconstruction. There's such a range from voluntary to involuntary and from liberation to trauma and um and i recognize that 
that such a big movement, it's become a movement now, I think, an era uh, requires some response. And um, I wasn't satisfied with some of the responses. <laughs> so, for example, on the one side, I felt like a real pastoral concern wherever the hand-wringing pastors were, were labeling deconstruction as just backsliding and really worrying about it and and even then condemning people. And I'm like, no, no, this is the faith. This is our tradition <laughs> that we that we ask hard questions and that we let go of old ways of thinking and that we enter dark nights of the soul. And so I, I, I felt like, um, like from sort of that quarter, there was a lot of pressure on people. And, and I wanted to, to say, no, what you're doing is right. It's good. But then on the other hand, I was also concerned for those who are just like in arsonist mode and it's like yeah burn it all down get rid of the faith we'll be you know just follow your heart and and um and there were those who took that advice but were experience they weren't experiencing healing from trauma and they're like wait a minute i i left the church but then i lost jesus i lost love i lost meaning and so so I, I felt like the cheerleading and the pom-poms that were being waved for the deconstructionists were, that wasn't working for the ones who were feeling alienated. So what do you do between the hand-wringing pastors who are condemning this as backsliding and the cheerleading deconstructionists who aren't regarding the traumatic version of it very well? or even faith. Um, and I felt like, well, the first thing to do is empathy. And to to say, I, I hear where you're at. And in fact, I don't think you're going too far. If anything, let's find healthy ways to move forward, so that we're not stuck in a birth canal. And that's one of the metaphors I would use for for this. Um, so that uh, all that to say, yeah, it was a, there, there was a pastoral care issue going on where I felt like if deconstruction can be about removing constructs that hinder my experience of the goodness of God, then, then uh, I want to bless that and, and uh, come alongside those who might just feel like it's a destruction or demolition of faith. You're on mute though, John. <laughs> I, didn't want it. I didn't want you to hear my dog barking in the background okay um but so just your response brad i just tell you right off the bat for me is one of the reasons i love your writing because you you just confirm that this pastoral care is at the core of who you are when you write and that comes through when you write and and i think that's really valuable because it's not just an intellectual exercise. It's not just, you know, an ideological sorting through. Um, it's really rooted in love for others um, and what's happening around you, as well as what happened in your own life. Because um, I know you have you have story there as well. That's true. So let me let me follow up that question with one more. And if you could talk, this is more a request question. If you talk a little bit about how there's so many factors that enter into this, a person's age, a person's exposure to religion, a person's maturity level, um, a person's, you know, how hard life has been for them as opposed to maybe how easy it's been for them. Just there's so many things that enter into this, uh, not only on the personal level, but also on a societal or cultural or community level. Could you talk a little bit about that and how that, and that maybe didn't frame, but maybe helped shape what you wrote and the way you went about it? Yeah, so um, I think I think that's important then that we say all of the above and look at how complex it is. And that means we're not going to be able to get a one-size-fits-all response to anybody. What we have to do is start by hearing their story. And so some of those stories, like you said, th these are individual stories. Some of them are social stories. Some of them are uh, upheaval of whole nations and how that affects them. And then like, so 
what's coming to mind right now also is the inevitability of what Richard Rohr calls liminal space, right? So when you have a child, when you have a a child grow up and leave home, uh, when you get your first job, when you retire, when you're uh, some who are getting married for the very first time, you know, some who are facing death, some who've experienced divorce, some who've, so like a lot of those things aren't even like, well, I'm going to go deconstruct now. It's sort of life, like life does it to you. And, and that is spiritual because then it can leave you asking, what is my orientation to God? What is my orientation to myself? What is my orientation to others? What is my orientation to the world? And that shifts um, and requires a shift every time you pass through a liminal space, which, by the way, just means door. It's a doorway. And one thing that occurred to me this year is that when Jesus says, I am the door, what that means is that he can, we can find him even in those liminal spaces that we regard as like, oh, no, this is scary. And I'm in between. I don't know who I was or what I'm going to be. And I feel so disoriented. And he's like, lucky I'm the door then, hey? <laughs> so I, that makes me feel better about the complexity of it. And, and you're on mute again, amazingly. So while you're on mute, I will say one of the subtitles I wanted to use, and I just couldn't, I had too many subtitles, but it was the necessity, the perils, and the possibilities of the great deconstruction. And I believe all three of those. Yeah. I'm not on mute now. Thank awesome. You. So I'm going to, I'm going to read, I was going to read a line and I'm just going to read it from the book. It says, we cannot and must not superimpose our unique experiences on others to minimize their stories of genuine spiritual abuse or to diminish the joy that they feel after a prison break from religious bondage. And I just really appreciated that balance and that pastoral heart um, for what is happening, not only in our own lives personally, but what we see in the lives of people we care about and how do we talk with them? How do we, how do we address um, what's happening um, with their faith in life? So thank you. So Thanks, I'm going to open it up. Yeah, absolutely. I thank you. I'm going to open it up to everybody else. So um, we'll probably do this in order here. So Cherith, I'm going to let you go first and ask whatever question you'd like of Brad about the book. And I think he's going to return the favor, but go ahead. It's your shot. How will I know when six minutes is up? <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry about six minutes. I will. Okay. I will. I'm cutting on you, Paul, to just be like, oh, okay. Okay, then you can go well, as long as you like. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I'll wave. I'll wave. Mm -hmm. Okay. okay. Um, Brad, I'm just going to lean into, I know one of the sweet spots for you um, of the whole book, the whole book made me laugh and cry and stop and walk and stare out the window and think and pray and all those many things. I don't think it's done its work on me yet, but just the first reading um, was that and then the refresher today. But I'm, I'm back to a conversation that you and I had in the summer that we just sort of touched on, but it, it came up again and I would love to hear you talk about this for all of us today. And that is, um, you and I were talking in the summer about the challenge that I was having with the language of the cross instead of the crucified Lord. And you were helping me to see that image as holding the whole of his life and the whole of the passion and his whole life as the passion. But knowing where I'm struggling and coming into more wholeness, that cross without a body on it was problematic for me. So um, I would love to hear you talk about that. But I also, the, the reason it sort of came up and it's not separate from where I really want you to go in your book, which is 
that when we're hearing Simone Weil talk about the cross as the the only place that can span affliction and goodness, right? That somehow that in in all of that that you mean and she means and the ways that we hear those throughout the book use that term. I'm thinking again, like just going back and looking at um, the James Cone section on the cross and the lynching tree and just like, so what is this doing? And, and I guess I just wanted to hear from you for our sake, a little bit about what it meant for you pre-deconstruction to think about what did take up your cross mean to you? And then how that has been so reconfigured through all of this, because it, it was the place of great hope really for me leaving the end of the book was this is a real invitation and it's an invitation outside the gates outside the city um, where my white privilege has never taught me ever to expect <laughs> to to be transformed in the ways that actually give me my humanity back so i just would love for you to talk about taking up your cross before and after and how the cross signifies all the things that matter most to you Okay, well, so first of all, I can hardly remember what I would have thought take up your cross meant back then. Um, I suppose it's not so different, but now, but I, you know, I would have thought Jesus said, take up your cross and follow me. And so he's going to go, he's going to go uh, live his life in this world as someone who who loves and forgives and responds without violence to opponents and that following him will inevitably lead me into those same situations and call for those same responses. I don't know that I had a much of an idea other than that long ago, but it came to more clarity. Um, uh, partly because of the tradition I'm in now, the faith tradition and now where the cross no longer just means the crucifixion or a doctrine of atonement so in the orthodox world the cross means jesus christ the cross encompasses both his death and his resurrection um i don't even see the wood on the cross anymore i see the one standing there with his arms open to me and I see the wounds in his hands and I see how everyone is within his arm span. There's no one when, when Isaiah says like his arm is not too short to save. <laughs> that means that the timeline of the human race and all its afflictions um come together between the two those two wounds those two wounded hands and they pass right through his heart and so for me then um um the the cross then becomes a symbol of it will i i also identify it completely as the tree of life who is is jesus and so when my friends talk about god or universe or whatever what where Jesus comes to into that story is the wounds. So, but that that's not just like suffering and holes in his hands. It's talking about self-giving love, canonic love, cruciform love. It's a kind of love in this that I've seen in this person and I've experienced in my wounding. So, you know, it strikes me that especially those who've experienced powerful affliction, uh, Simone Weil, she would talk about like the, the deep impact of trauma is like a hammer. And the worse it is, the deeper it nails you into the heart of Christ. <laughs> and, and then I'm like, okay, well, then I don't know that much, but I know that the afflicted people I know of have experienced uh, divine love in their affliction. So just one more thing in the book, I talk about different ways or orientations to connect, talk about the via negativa, via positiva, via um, uh, creativa, and the via active, activa. I would now add the, the via afflictiva, and that is in our afflictions, we have someone who can empathize with us. And, and, um, to to take up the cross then might might mean 
something like that, that I join him in that work of empathy in this world or something like that co-suffering love, um, you know, with, with the folks who were murdered in the club yesterday and the, the women in Iran and, and, uh, all of that, if I can just make it not just trauma and suffering, but somehow co-suffering love that were the wounds of Jesus release something into the world that can redeem. So, yeah. Now I have a question for you. <laughs> well, can I say one more thing just to say thank you to you? You're welcome. I, mean... <laughs> <laughs> I also want to say thank you that, that one of the things that was really meaningful to me in reading this book, and I just have it like on my Christmas list for many people now, because of all the generations in my family and friends who will enter that book from really different places, but they, they need to know, and you're inviting them to know that the story that they're coming in with can be held between those arms on that cross of co-suffering love. Mm -hmm. And it struck me that as you were bringing in the seven sleepers and as we were revisiting and whether it was in actual history or novel or whatever, that most of what they were able to finally say that was truthful was either because it was coming out of their own suffering and or affliction or their willingness to actually not turn away. And, and I just feel like right now there's a, a level of conversation in the church that is the kind of, I'm afraid to look to see it burn down but I'm also want to look away from everybody who lit the matches or what inside made them want to. And, and I guess I just was so grateful for the, the chance to actually listen well and to listen to the critiques, to listen to the pain, to listen to the hope um, by those that you chose to bring us into conversation with. And yeah, I thought differently about every single one of their voices and writing and saw them sort of held between those arms with me as um, not figures to learn from, but people to stand with and realize that because we're not really good at self-critique, that actually those are the places I need to stand closest. So just want to say thank you for doing that hard work for us and helping us be less afraid maybe of that work. So thanks. thank you. Thank you. Um, so Cherith, you and I have talked a lot about, you know, how you, you deconstructed with the help of your dad um, of blessed memory, um, the the um, a Gnostic vision of humanity. Um, I didn't warn you; I was going to ask you this part. I'm wondering. So, so for listeners, you know, the Gnostic version of humanity is very anti-body it's really dualistic between body and soul and there's a almost a a rejection of of our our bodily humanity and and you saw how things like um purity culture played into that for example and how you regarded yourself especially when being objectified i'm wondering though what um how that changed your view of God. Um, what was deacon? What constructs? What not? And it doesn't have to be the Gnostic ones, but specifically, you don't see God the way you used to. And so, what's changed? Well, just front and center, the incarnation, um, and that's not an idea. I mean. I grew up really loving God the Father because I trusted God the Father because I trusted my father. And I trusted the love that my father knew from his father in heaven. I knew and trusted the spirit because I was in churches where actually the spirit, the presence of God, the spirit was really manifested the vast majority of my growing up. Um, all embraced in the fruit of the character of God, the spirit. And so I trusted that the spirit wanted 
that God wanted to speak to us and hear us and be present to us in ways that were not just signs, right, of his presence or power, but that just the way that um, John McMurray brought this forward in the conversation that I always feel like the spirit was among us in pastoral concern, right? Like he really wanted to heal us and to change our perspective and to give us eyes to see each other differently, or our own lives differently, or our place in the world differently. And, and I don't even know how that worked on me as a little kid, but it did. Um, but the person I didn't know in the Trinity was Jesus until I was in my late thirties and I knew about him. I could say all the things I needed to say about him. I, I was grateful to him. If one can use that little word, <laughs> saving me, but he was still saving my soul. Right. And because I didn't know what to do with the life I was living and certainly didn't take his life seriously for my own life. Um, I, I just felt like in so many ways where I try to draw near to him, it just felt capricious and un, just unkind a lot of times. Like, well, that's easy for you to say because you're, and then I can just fill in the blanks now with all the heretical ways that I was viewing Jesus that had nothing to do with my life. So the idea of his life spanning his life, death, resurrection, ascended life, like spanning the whole of human experience, that just was not the story I knew. So just profoundly and transformatively, I met um, Jesus of Nazareth as this God man and began to watch his life as the life that I knew growing up, which was one who knew themselves loved by the father and wanted to live in love and the pleasure of the father's will. And that was who was functioning in the life and power of the spirit. And, and then just watch him for who he really is, right? Who's showing us what God really looks like. And all of a sudden, the ways that I began to see um, the father could finally shed their self onto Jesus and vice versa. And so I think still what I'm, what I still probably have is a Jesus who sounds like me, who talks like me. Um, so when I think of the one who mediates my life, it's in my voice oftentimes. And the way that he is both really pressing on me and, and yet in a really just, I just with a chuckle, right? <laughs> so like um, part of your salvation, honey, is to keep letting me actually have my authentic life that I lived and have and am as this Jewish man, but also the fact that the only way that you'll have a Christian imagination who's able to um, sit with me in the places where I'm talking and moving and acting in history and now in your history is probably by seeing me and people who look nothing like you and listening to those who's whose experience is so unlike your privileged experience and all of the deformation that has happened to you in that and the ways that I project onto God, all of that deformation. So um, yeah, it's just been a very um, profound, I'm just, I don't think I sing like love songs to Jesus in the kind of sentimental high schooly love songs, but, but I, I can say now in a very different way that I, I love Jesus, not just as a brother there. I am in capital love. I'm just so caught up in the love that he is in my flesh and it's changed my life. Wow. Thanks, Cherith. I, I will. Uh, you should write a book. Yeah. I, I want to just say thank you back to you that you, you have introduced me to uh, Jesus as brother. Um, that's interesting when you, no one says that more than you do that I know of. And so it's made me think in new ways of like, that's very helpful to me um, at in particular ways. So thank you. So McMurray, who's next? Yeah. Felicia. All right. Felicia, go ahead. Oh, my heart is full, Cherry. That was beautiful. Thank you. 
I'm I'm still stirred. Um, Brad, my friend, thank you for the invite. I have been saying since a more Christ-like God, this is the best book ever. Like it stirs in my heart and stirs in my heart. And then you'll write another one. And it's the best book ever. And it stirs in my heart. And I'm thinking, damn it, he keeps writing these books and they keep stirring in my heart and stirring in my heart. And um I legit, I'm scrolling through my notes, trying to just form a question to ask. I, I want to I mention a quote first, and then I actually do have a question for you. Okay. But I just, I, I'm curious to see over time how many highlights this particular quote will have, because I have stared at it probably a lot of times, let's just say that, since I read, read the book the first time. Christ is the ultimate deconstructionist. I'd never thought of Christ in those terms. So that first was just mind blowing to even sit with. Um, and it's effectively converting whole lives, a whole species, a whole cosmos by gathering all things and all people into himself, entering the chrysalis of death in Hades then re-emerging to transfigure all things with his eternal life. What a beautiful picture and a beautiful invitation. Um, thank you for that one. Um, my question for you, there's a, there's a, there's a stream, stream, a thread, let's use that word. I can see it, but it wasn't coming to me, a thread that I see throughout this book. And um, it's not just in this book, but it's in your writings of the continuity of communion, of community, of teachers and guides and friends. And you mentioned even earlier when you were talking with John about the pastoral concern of deconstructing in, in alienation. And, um, one of the things that you talk often of the people that you walk with, um, your spiritual directors, the people that you converse with and that. And so I would love to kind of form a question around the importance of community through the process of deconstruction, how that was a lifeline for you and then how you see that playing um, through the reconstruction of faith for others as they go through the process of deconstruction. Thanks, Felicia. By the way, I had the best gossip session about you today. It's like someone was saying, are you working with her more now? I'm like, I sure hope so. <laughs> they're like, oh, she's awesome. You know, so, and hi from the folks at Hope for Life in Miami to all of you guys. Um, but um, yeah, you, you came up in conversation as one of those companions and teachers for me. So, yeah, I, uh, so in my case, you're exactly right that my community was a lifeline. So here's where I have a poverty, uh, like, I, I feel like uh, some survivor's guilt. Because when I was melting down, my community didn't alienate me and abandon me or cast me out. Um, they came around me. And I know full well that that is not everyone's story. So my commitment to this idea of presence in communion is, is both a very deep gratitude, but also a terrible sorrow for when I see those who experience alienation instead of communion. And those words now have, have come, to, what those words mean to me now is what I think Jesus means in the gospel of John by perishing and eternal life mm -hmm. that perish. He didn't come to condemn the world. He came to find a perishing world and, and, and to save us from perishing and by, and I think by perishing that um, he means alienation, which is a good psychological term for hell. And then he doesn't come to say, well, when you die, um, you'll go to heaven someday that's not eternal life to him. Eternal life is to know him and his father and to be in communion 
uh, with a, as beloved children and brothers and sisters who commune with each other. So I just see this, in, the importance of a, a trajectory, um, not just from old constructs to no constructs, but from alienation that can happen inside our constructs or even after we fled them. And so I'm watching these poor folks who've been like experienced spiritual abuse, for example, in a, in a faith community, they must leave. They maybe even follow Jesus out, but now in their exodus, there, there can be that sense of, well, now I'm isolated and I don't have friends and I don't know where to turn and what do I do? And, um, and, and so I, I do feel like for them, the medicine is, communion it is it is um what my godfather calls presence in communion so it's i'm present to you you're present to me that's communion and there's an exchange of grace and that these exchanges of grace are even like much bigger than the christian world for example you know and so i'm always surprised even where i can experience a moment of communion and it's not even always with my most intimate friends. Sometimes it is with the stranger. And I'm like, wow, we just had a connection. And um, Rowan William calls that where God happens. So I think that's such a great phrase. <laughs> it's, a little, it's a little classic book of his. Where God happens is in those moments where we experience that connection. So um, and then I would just to relate that to faith, then that if we could somehow facilitate living connection, because a lot of folks who've deconstructed actually have left places or groups where they never had it to begin with. And I want to, I usually would say, like, encounters so important, but um, people mistook that for dramatic encounter. And I'm like, no, it doesn't have to be dramatic. <laughs> it has to be a living connection. And what what can I do to bring people into that? And um, that matters a lot to me. So I don't know if that answers your question, but it addresses that thread for sure. All right. Now, what am I going to ask you, Felicia? How are you? How are you so awesome anyway? <laughs> <laughs> um. Okay, this is this will be a striking point. My favorite chapter in the book is the one you helped me with on God's black voice. And I guess um like I was terrified because I I I knew that the best thing to do is to speak as a student of who is trying to hear this voice instead of speaking for people that I have no right to speak for. And so by the time we were done working that chapter over together, um, I'm like, I, I'm like, I, I'm, I'm so glad I had a guide, you know, and that I still do. But maybe you could just share back to me and to, to the people listening, like, what do we mean by God's black voice? What is that? What's unique and precious and. Oh. I think that's a beautiful question, Brian. I, um, you know, I, I think it is um, the pieces or some of the pieces, definitely not all, because they're of uh, what's missing, what's sometimes silenced or overlooked. Um, you know, I, I think a lot of times um, exposure is one thing. So uh, when you think of theologians, who people read um, is important. It's like the, the um, new Bible translation that just came out for First Nations. Um, I think when, when we get to really, really experience the fullness of God's tapestry and all voices and all races and all people, it only makes us better. Um, and I think it only, it only opens us up to a broader and a deeper sense of communion. So it's back to that uh, where God happens, you know? And I felt like not just in that chapter, but also in the other stories that you told of 
the ladies that um, this was God happening. And you could see that over and over again. And I think so many times, uh, particularly if you've been raised in with Christianity as your, um, you know, your faith tradition, you're used to the box of this being the only place, this being institutional church, the only place where God can happen. And um, like Cherith was saying earlier, you're, you're not looking, you're not looking to see God. And it reminds me of Burton standing on the corner in Louisville, Kentucky. And, um, you know, and cap capturing a glimpse of the sacred through the bystander that passes by and just seeing God in that moment and how that was so transformative for him. And so when I think about Howard Thurman, when I think about James Cone, when I think about um, Valerie Carr, um, you know, when I think about all of these people, God's voices are shining through, but there are so many people that aren't familiar with these voices or the sound of God through these people. And so, I mean, I just commend you one for wanting to include um, I think that's very big of who you and Eden are as people to be intentional about inclusion. And so um, just to even have the opportunity to do that with you was a real honor. Um, but I really, I, I, and, and I know that you were not doing it for shock factor. I know that it was a real um, heart intent behind it. But um, yeah, so I'll just stop there. Thanks, Felicia. You know, part of that exercise of just walking through that chapter for me, it kind of um, it it sort of damaged my idea of inclusion in the in a good way. Where inclusion is when I'm going to bring outsiders to my table. But what the message there and in the martyrs chapter was like, no, actually the table's out there, and uh, like where the lynching tree was. And if you want to if you want to hear the gospel, then like. Maybe they'll include you, but like we've got to go outside the camp to get to there. Like, and then and then you could just see sort of the assumptions that are made even in inclusion, right? This is my table. Aren't you lucky to come to it? <laughs> you know, like, ah. So we start, but we have to start somewhere. And it's yeah. uh, and I, I think that's the thing. It even goes back to, you know, earlier this month with John. It's like there's a point, there's a starting point. And that is the beauty of relational connection. Right, because then inside of relational connection, there's a safety. So when I when I make the messes and when I say the wrong thing or when it's not all politically correct, I'm standing on the strength of our love and our trust. And I'm trusting the safety of that, that I'm gonna say, oh Brad, maybe not like that. Or maybe, or maybe take that and consider that. And that happens with relational connection. I think a lot of times where that goes south is people try to drive a, you know, 10,000 ton truck across a bridge that has no relational capital. Okay. And if it does not have the strength of relational connection to support that, it's going to make a mess, you know? And so I, I am safe with you. I, you know, I want you to feel that same sense of safety that as you are walking out the intent of your heart, you can just trust it and know that, oh, she's not going to hate me tomorrow because I said that the wrong way or whatever. So, you know, that's the beauty of relational connection. Wow. Thank you so much. I like I I sense the um, infinite patience that you have. And I, I appreciate the safety that affords me. Yeah. I, now, Ken Wayne disappeared. So I guess Paul Young is up next. Kenneth wasn't scheduled to be one of the talkers, but since um, Brian Zond is having his memorial service with for his mom tonight, or I mean the viewing, he couldn't be with us. So I don't know if there'll be time, but Paul's up next, I guess. Is that correct? Ken, Ken, yes, Kenneth Paul. is back. Kenneth yeah, is back. No, Paul, Paul, you're up. We're running oh. out of time. Okay. We're running out of time. Yeah, I'm, and Paul's I'm, up. I'm just here to listen to Felicia and Karen. <laughs> yeah, me too. So, uh, um. You know how much I love you, Brad. So, you know, pretty much anything you do, I'm going to love it anyway. And, um, but you write, you write a razor's edge. That's, that's what's so significant to me is you have the pastoral dimension as an academic, which is highly unusual. 
in terms of how theologians tend to write. They tend to write to a small audience with very specific kind of language. And so there's a lot of education that happens in, in what you write, but there's never a loss of the pastoral side of caring for the people. You have one of the best, I've learned a lot from you about remembering that the person that I'm talking to has their own world and they're coming from it. And so as quickly as you're able, climb into their shoes and and you do that so well um and it's it's softened a lot of my language and and again i've seen you do that in this book so i have a lot of questions but i'll ask you a, a, a couple couple of the easy ones that are sort of like oh thanks okay. <laughs> yeah so um what in the course of writing this what surprised you Give me a moment. Yeah. Um, so uh, one surprise was how um, traumatized I got in writing it. Um, so for example, I opened the book with my resignation letter and I just caught, reread it. I copied it, pasted it and um and then had the most violent nightmares that I've had in 20 years that night. That wow. kind of surprised me. Um, another thing that surprised me was how scared I got by my vulnerability. And, and I'm like, you really helped me because you're more honest than I am. And I'm like, but you pushed me. And, and, uh, and, and but I, I got actually scared. And then, um, and then I knew I had to do these, you know, the, the these things on the problem of pain, especially at where push comes to shove on the suffering of children. And um, I, I included trigger warnings on that because it hit me um, as hard as the, as, as, you know, the first time I ever read Dostoevsky on, and about the children and about Bulgakov's kids and these suffering kids. And I, and I'm like, oh, I get it. Um, this doesn't get easier, and it's not supposed to. And that kind of surprised me. And then I can't talk even about these ancient martyrs without crying. And I'm like, what's that? <laughs> so um, I have a funny story to tell you about that. It's I see um, the three female martyrs, or two and a half kind of, one's a living martyr, I saw them and, and their arms are outstretched in the cruciform and they look me in the eyes and they go deconstruct this bitch. <laughs> I thought, like that's what I, that was an experience I had. And that really surprised me. I mean, it was a profound experience. <laughs> it wasn't making something up. It's what I heard in my head. And it felt embarrassing and it felt, but I, I've never told, I don't think I've said that publicly before, <laughs> but it, it, it um, yeah. So th I guess that that's a thread too, right? Through the whole thing is that the surprises were about the painful part and, and just like, okay, if I can just get this book out of the way, you know, <laughs> I don't even like this anymore, but, but actually that, you know, I finally got to Simone Ve again and she, rescued me again she came mm -hmm. alongside me and i even got to talk to her niece again on her 80th birthday um mm. and i'm like okay i'm gonna be okay and especially with this group of healers in my life you know so thanks for asking so much for the so, easy question Paul. <laughs> <laughs> but i knew it was the right one <laughs> yes yes uh, um so you know, I, it was the question that came to mind, and uh, I'm very grateful to the Holy Spirit that that was a question that came to mind, because you suddenly have taken... Me too. 
you've taken this out of a shelf of books and you've put human skin on it just in terms of this response. And uh, I'm grateful for that. I'm really grateful for that um, because it's, it's more than just a word, it's an incarnate word, right? And so for those who have the honor of, like me, of being here in this moment, it's really a holy ground kind of thing. And, uh, but I'm also thrilled to hear that it wasn't just that clash of history and the harm and the work that you had to do to get out of it, but the comfort that was mm -hmm. also there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I will never see those saints the same way. <laughs> <laughs> It reminds me of, you know, Jason Upton's son, Sam, he's in university now, but when he was like a toddler sucking his thumb and he pulled the thumb out of the side of his mouth one time when his dad was playing and he, um, he pointed at the theology books in the top shelf. He said, dad, do you think if we took those books down and threw them in the air, do you think they could fly? <laughs> And that became this metaphor for us about, you know, what, what does it take for a theology book to take, you know, to take wings, to take wings. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So did you have another question or is it my turn? It takes becoming flesh. Yeah, it does. Cheers. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, I told you I have a bunch of questions, but ask yours. And then if I don't like it, I'll go back to one of mine. Okay. Mine's a pretty simple one. Um, I started thinking today about you and and that like your book lies we believe about god that's a deconstruction book so it is every lie is a construct and and by addressing those lies you're deconstructing and every every construct you removed brought us closer to the the truth of who god is and 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 um so maybe um my question could be is there is there one lie that you really see that's operative that you would most love to help people discard yeah separation ah good right. you know the distinction between separation and alienation mm. you know that ontologically you can't be separated i was just talking felicia to some of our friends in the uk that you made that connection for and spent a couple hours with your friend and, and uh today and and the struggle with the scripture was largely to do with the distinction between the reality that we can never be separated, right? That love is based on knowing. And there is no one who knows us with the love of the Father, like, like the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So it is perfect, complete, and pure. And then that love will never leave me or forsake me as I journey through the alienation, which is in my life, right? And uh, which has been dealt to me because of some of the theology and some of the trauma and some of the experiences. And so the journey of deconstruction is not one that should ever be grounded in fear in terms of relationship to God. That is the safest place to begin to ask questions. And it's an invitation because God has never wanted playthings or machinery. And uh, so I, th I think that's my first response is how significant that question is about separation versus alienation. It's one that's on my mind right now. You know, there's a lot of a lot of them that are they need to be deconstructed in our hearts. And uh, but to me, that's that's a big one right now. A, a kind of a follow up question. And um, and that is why now? Why? Why is the dramatic level of deconstruction so profound on the planet right now? And it's like it's everywhere 
And, and I have an idea of part of the answer to that, but I wondered what you would say. Can I get to hear yours first? <laughs> sure. I'll nice. tell you. The internet. No. Oh. <laughs> you know, like the printing press? Mm -hmm. It's it's so much harder to stay <laughs> in, um, in boxes anymore that that people can't you know you can see the different countries trying to control the masses of people by limiting access to books or to film but now to online conversations and uh when i grew up i mean all i heard was my own people and their voice reflected back to me through a very narrow box and it was fear about everything else mm. And uh, so there is a huge accessibility to different different thoughts and different ways of thinking, which also, you know, brings a lot of its own trauma too. But uh, I think that the computer, in a sense, has been the printing press, in a sense. Yeah, that really feels right to me. Uh, I, I want to share a reason that's non-technical. Um to be, I, I think, uh, two sides of a coin. One, so one is that the, the, well, no, yeah. So the coin is that our constructs of God are coming apart on, on, a, on a massive scale. And one side of that coin is the negative. It's that that construct didn't work for us anymore. We've bottomed out on it. It's come to its terminus. And people are getting off the train. And that's a, that's, it's a negative reason, but it's a good thing, you know, that when, when, and then the, the positive side of the same coin is I, I do think there's been an outpouring of a revelation that God is love. So, and, and specifically, you know, some would call it the father's house or the father's heart revelation, the prodigal son revelation. And, and, and this has really been picking up steam for since now um, the seventies mm -hmm. uh, for sure. But like, let's say in the 50s, it would it would be very normal to preach a hellfire and brimstone and God is angry at you message and still like draw a crowd and actually see a response. And and I just think that that's proven to be so unfruitful. And isn't it wonderful then that just at the very same time you get books like The Shack come out showing you a beautiful alternative, a beautiful gospel, a beautiful God. And, and I think that's that kind of thing has, or my friend, you know, Brian Dirks and all his father's heart songs and welcoming the prodigal back. Um, that's got some momentum that's impressive and it accelerates deconstruction and it also can steer it in healthy directions. And yeah, because it not only deconstructs the nature of God, it deconstructs the nature of humanity. Mm -hmm. And that has really exploded because you know if it was us and them about our theology it was us and them about our humanity yep and and as one begins to disintegrate the other is disintegrating really quickly mm. and um, so huge huge season of exposure but like you say i believe it, you're absolutely right a huge season of the goodness of god that is active and powerful yeah we're we're just about out of time. Thanks, um, John. I, oh, absolutely. I've got to keep us on, on task. Um, Brad, it. you know this. You know that um, I, my, I've been in an ongoing deconstruction, and that continues. I liken it a lot to the word repentance, the biblical word of repentance, that I keep being um, given the opportunity to change and that Jesus is doing that every day saying, John, here's a, here's a place where you can grow. Here's a place where you can change. Um, but there's things that need to happen, come apart in order for this to fill in the space. You you've got the space all cluttered and filled up. And the metaphor that, that we've talked about this before as well, the metaphor that I often think about is the metaphor I got from McDonald and that's the one of fire. Yeah, it purifies, but it's painful, you know. Um, it destroys, but it doesn't destroy me. 
it destroys what's destroying me. And so uh, I think your book is not only beautiful, Brad, and I think you're, you know how much all of us on the panel love you and, and are so supportive of you and what you've done here with this and what you continue to do. But especially as Paul is just saying, what's happening in our world today and that you spoke to this with such clarity and compassion, we're grateful. Um, it's a book that we can now give to our friends and people that we know that speaks for us um, in ways that are better than we can say it ourselves. So thank you. Thank you, okay. John. I want to do Absolutely. a big shout out to Susan Carson also, who um, established the launch team. And, and um, that has turned into a surprising community and uh, really interesting ways, even that the community as it's gathered around these themes is actually changing. I, I'm hearing it's a different group than it was three weeks ago. It's very strange and fun and weird. And um, But she's put in an enormous amount of work into this. So I, I wanted to say thank you to Susan. She's just uh, a gift and a gem and a, a wonderful facilitator. So between her and John McMurray and Jonathan, we got, we got this, this evening going. And uh, I'm so glad. Thanks. You're welcome. And Jonathan, uh, if you're still there, if you could throw up on the <laughs> throw up, if you could put up on the screen um, the link where people can get the book, there's the cover of the book, but there's a link where you can still get the book today, I believe tomorrow. And if you order it through this link, you'll also get a free copy You'll see it right there on the left, a pre-order special of a more Christ-like word. So it's actually two books for the price of one. Okay. So he's um, copied the link and I think he'll paste it in the chat. Is that right? Yes. And we'll also put it up on Facebook. This has been recorded. It will be up on Facebook. Um, we'll have it on our website. People can take a look um, if th those of you who want to. Um, but we would encourage you to, uh, I think someone already said it in the chat, Christmas gifts, exclamation point, Brad's book. Get so. a whole box, man. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, there's Sheriff so many Felicia good books Paul. you're looking forward to here. Oh, my goodness. Kenneth, yes. th thank you all for being here and being a part of this. Um, I know you're all at different schedules and different times, but thank you so much. And thank you, Felicia, because I'm sure the book would not be what it is without your participation. That's true. Really true. Absolutely. Okay. Right. We're going to sign off now. Thanks again for, every, for everybody for being here. And Kenneth, thanks for helping out. Love you see all. You later. Love you too. Yep. Bye. Okay. Ciao. Good to see y'all. Good times, my man. Thanks, Ken and Wayne. Yeah, we had about 35 over on Facebook watching. <laughs>